For the second part of your lab today, we're going to be looking at salinity and how that really affects plants. So, in previous classes, you've learned about the tonicity and the uh, osmosis, the movement of water. Uh, and the tonicity of a solution versus the tonicity of a plant is something that we can look at with something called water potential. So, if you're curious, it's available for you to look at. So there are two parts to every solution there's the solutes and the solvent okay the way I always remember solvent is water is the universal solvent and so it's the aqueous portion so the water portion then there's the solutes okay solutes is things that you've dissolved into this aqueous solution this solvent okay we can use the terms of tonicity to compare relative concentrations of these solutions if they are similar, if the solution the plant is in is similar to the solution of the plant, okay, you've got an isotonic solution. If there are more actual solutes in the solution that the plant is sitting in than what is in the plant, it's a hypertonic solution. If there are less solutes on the outside of the plant, then what is what is on the inside it's hypotonic solution the one that you really want for your plants is a hypotonic solution this is because it allows water to move into the cells okay because water is going to move to the higher concentration of your solutes okay wherever you have a higher concentration of solutes that's where your water is going to move to and we can actually calculate this using something called water potential which is something that's not included in this lab but if you get into botany later you may end up actually seeing that okay so water moves into plants through the roots by the process of osmosis so in order for water to move into the roots and surrounding tissue you've got to have a lower solute concentration on the outside which means you need a hypotonic solution okay if it is hypertonic water is going to go the wrong direction. It's going to dry your plant out. Well, why does this even matter? Well, you've got this really, really cool ecosystem here. This really cool ecosystem. You've got the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The Chesapeake Bay watershed, in this case, you've got a mountain range that is going to allow water to flow down towards the east coast okay it's flowing down and it's going to hit the Chesapeake Bay this large body of water here okay this Chesapeake Bay is getting water inflow also from the ocean specifically it's the Atlantic Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean has salt water in it okay about 30, 30 to 33 parts per million so in this case that salt water is going to push back in into the Chesapeake Bay and it's going to mix with this fresh water that's now coming down from the mountains out in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. All of this is pushing water down into this mixing bowl that we call the Chesapeake Bay. Well when we get this salt water and fresh water mixing we get what's called a brackish. water okay so this brackish water is a blending between the two well okay why is that important well you also are going to have shallower water in the Chesapeake Bay which means that as the Sun hits it you're going to actually lose water due to evaporation so what salt is in there is going to become more and more concentrated so that concentrated salt now is going to wash up on the shoreline through wave action and deposit those salt deposits there on the shore which means now plants have to deal with a very salty solution right around the shore and a little further inland because as we have global warming and ice caps melting the sea level is rising and that's going to push more of this water up into the land masses okay well when we do this we start to build up this salt concentration well not all plants can survive that but some can some have adapted okay over time through evolutionary selection the plant has adapted okay now 
those adaptations allow them to tolerate that salt and there are different mechanisms for this we're not going to get into in this class but just in general you can see how it affects plants in the native ecosystem but it also affects crop plants farmers have problems with this we're going to get to that here in a minute so you would have actually in this lab taken and collected some data now this data you would have taken a probe stuck it into a solution of soil mixed in with some salty water and taken some measurements they would have come out in parts per thousand you would have had a soil sample for a between zero and two and for b it would have been four to eight and c it would have been 12 to 20 somewhere in those ranges so in your actual lab please fill in these values and use these actual ranges to talk about whether it's a high salinity a low salinity and what kind of effects this could have okay well one of the species that it can can actually increase the actual production of is salt grass so this lichus spicata so in this case this species of grass tolerates high salt concentrations in the soil very well uh, I'm from Texas in South Texas region and in this case I was actually privileged enough to go to a school where we were on an island and one of the big species that's salt tolerant in that area is actually going to be your black mangrove black mangrove is very tolerant and it actually is a huge fish habitat because of that the water can move up into the mangrove when the tide comes in as it pushes in you end up getting salt deposits in the soil because it can tolerate that it fills what's called a niche or a niche when you're looking at an ecosystem all right so it's pretty interesting how all that works so let's take and let's actually look at a an example here so what I did is I took and I grew some snap peas at my house because, well, I just want to snap peas. Uh, I took and over the period of three days, I placed some peas into some leftover plastic containers that I had. I added some water with different actual concentrations of salt. So one of them, the one in the middle, in or left in this case, middle here, I kind of shuffled them around has just deionized water so just pure water okay the other two I mixed with that pure water I mixed 1% salt solution and 5% salt solution so what this works out to be is this is basically zero parts per million this is 10 and this is approximately 50 and excuse me I said parts per million I mean parts per thousand okay so I took and I grew these over the three days and I actually planted them so the, some peas were harmed in this sorry uh, but in this case you can start to see that there was actually growth okay and somehow day one is gone and day two should I this is day two so this is actually day three but you can see here that generally there was a growth pattern over those couple of days. So this is day two, this is day three, and this is day eight where I had them planted. So in this case, you've got pea plants that were exposed to different salinities. Well, that's cool and all, but you know, wh where does this actually apply? Well, now we get into the data. Okay. Sorry if this comes through a little grainy, but in this case you can see that I had my DI here, I had my 1% and my 3% all on day 1. So note that there was no growth, nothing happened on day 1 like it would be expected, that was only 12 hours. And day 2, in this case note that you had 0.9 was your average rate of radical length growth so 0.9 centimeters so that means that basically I had a growth rate of one centimeter 
for the DI solutions, but for the actual salt solutions, I got nothing. Oh, so you can start to see it really has an effect. Well, let's go into day three. Day three, you have 2.2. So, yet again, you're now at one centimeter per day. Okay, it's pretty cool. So you've got one centimeter per day as your relative average growth rate. So this would be my control. Well, I had nothing happen here, and then, oh wait, for my 1% solution, my 10 parts per thousand, I ended up having somewhere near about 60 to 70% of the growth rate happen that I had in day two and day three in my DI and I had nothing in my actual 50 parts per thousand so that in and of itself shows that there's something going on you can also take and look at the cotyledon presence there is a tenfold difference between the two so it can affect the actual formation of the cotyledons by 10 times just by increasing the actual percentage to 1% of salt. That's a huge effect. Now, something I'm leaving out here, peas are highly affected by salt concentrations. Okay, so I kind of knew in three days I'd get some data. Well, because of my curious cat, and because of some mold that I actually ended up having grow, okay? If you notice, there's also some in the DI. So the mold itself pretty much stopped my experiment. It made it to where it was no longer viable. Why? What, what could it actually be that led to this? Well, I mean, for one, mold is going to happen but you can control it and I probably didn't control it as well as I should have but when you take and look at it the mold is gonna take and utilize resources is is the pea getting resources and energy from outside well I mean if you look at a seed the energy is coming from what its parent gave it it's not actually generating its own energy yet because it doesn't have leaves until it gets those cotyledons up Okay, so that means that eventually that mold is just going to decimate those seeds. There's going to be nothing left. Okay, so I had one third of my peas were affected by this mold in the 50 parts per thousand. So that told me there I probably needed to stop the experiment. Okay, something else to note is that you only really started to see root hairs being present in the DI. Now, why would root hairs not want to come up in a salt water solution? Well, that's tonicity. You don't want to increase your surface area into a solution that's already salty. It's going to just cause you to lose more water. Okay? So, in your lab report, there's going to be questions about this. Please review this. If you have any questions, please reach out to your lab instructor.